And what I can share is that if there's anybody who doesn't want to be on screen or doesn't want their comments to be recorded, we can turn them off now. We, uh, when, when, when it's your turn to speak. Um, but I just want to say that we try and be open and transparent at these meetings. Um, I'll also sh share there are some media people here today to observe and when we go around and do introductions, they can they can introduce themselves. Uh, quick update, uh, we're about two thirds through the Vermont's part-time legislature. Um, going into this session, Democrats had top priorities being paid family and medical leave, expanding childcare support so parents can afford it and early ed teachers can afford to work there too and get paid better than working at a fast food restaurant. We wanna address climate change, creating more housing. And all of those bills are moving between the House and Senate. We're addressing those priorities and more. And one of the things we're working on as well is a, a life-saving bill um, that combines suicide prevention and gun safety reform. It includes safe storage of firearms, a 72 hour waiting period for gun purchases and expanding our ERPO laws, the emergency protection orders, especially in domestic abuse cases. It turns out Vermont has a pretty high suicide rate and the preponderance of those suicides are by firearm. And that seems to be the determining factor. It's not mental health issues, although sometimes it is, uh, or depression. But for the most part, the research shows it's having access to a firearm and it's a impulsive action. And our thoughts are that making guns less accessible with the waiting period, having safe storage so young people can't get to them and the emergency protection orders can save lives. And that's why we're pushing this. Now I work on the government operations committee and one bill I wanna talk about is something that I think registers systemically. Um, and we have a lot of systems ongoing right now that are not working and we need to address them. And uh, one of them is public safety dispatch. Now dispatch is what happens after you call 911. It's when the emergency call is relayed to police, fire or ambulance. Now those services are statewide, but they're a mishmash of local and state police service and we have a situation where some towns pay to be part of this and get the services and some don't pay to get and get the services. Uh, we feel an equitable system would be better organized and paid for by all Vermont towns, as well as better organized to use staff and resources. The systemic aspect of this carries over in, into other areas of state and local government where regionalized approaches, uh, I think need to be considered, whether it's EMS, police, fire, or even at the town level with listers and appraisers, we're experiencing having enough people step up and be parts of this. So state or regional solutions to supplement local services may be needed to keep those. Um, one last thing I will say is as we head towards the last third of this session, and you have a bill that you've been watching, um, if it doesn't get through this year, it's not dead. It's still alive and can be taken up in next year, the second year of our biennium. And um, so if you've got an idea also, please feel free. Um, or if you have a piece of state government that's not working for you, um, please get in touch with us. Sometimes we, especially being in the building with a lot of uh, government leadership, we can see people in the halls and maybe um, get something moving that's blocked up. So feel free to be in touch with us. And at this point, I'm gonna let Nader introduce himself and share a little bit about the Senate perspective. Thanks, Mike. And sorry about the uh, little interruption there earlier. It's um, like like you said, as I was walking away, it is it is a part of living in Vermont, having horses walk down your driveway. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we just had a very, uh, a, a very historic week, in my opinion, in the Senate, we passed our uh, housing bill. We passed our child care bill. And one of the things that um, another step that we took regarding climate change is we passed a bill to start the process of divesting from fossil fuels in our uh, uh, pension portfolio. 
So it's been it's been a pretty hectic week um, in a good way. And you know, for, uh, for those of you who don't know, I do currently serve on the Judiciary Committee in the morning, where I'm the vice chair, and I serve on the Education Committee in the afternoon. And you know, right now, so, some of the things that we've done in Judiciary, we've really focused on taking steps to reduce the court backlog. Um, and you know, this is this is an area where you can't just pass one single bill and suddenly everything gets fixed. You know, it's a very uh, complex web of issues that has led to, you know, people having their cases pending since 2016, 2017. <clears throat> so that's that's been a priority for me. We're also going to be taking up the uh, the firearms bill that uh, Representative Merwicki was just describing, H-230. We're starting testimony on that this upcoming week. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to rehash everything he just said, but, you know, the the provisions in that bill will save lives and you know i'm planning to support it uh, we also on, on on thursday we voted out a bill very quickly which you know it, it didn't require there wasn't really any opposition to it this was a bill to ban child marriage in vermont uh, some of you may not know you can still get married under the age of 18 in vermont and what we learned during the testimony is that you know, it's of of the of the people who've gotten married in Vermont under the age of 18, 83 percent of them are are girls who are marrying men who are at least four years older than them. And it, it was a pretty shocking statistic uh, that we heard. And, you know, some of the some of the concerns that try to get raised are, you know, what about the, the high school sweethearts who are seven were both 17 years old? But According to the data, that's really not what we're seeing. So um, all the surrounding states are raising the age of marriage to 18, and we really don't want Vermont to be the state that's known as the place where you can still get married under the age of 18. So um, we'll be voting on that on the floor on Tuesday. We'll also be voting on H89, which is uh, the shield bill, which helps to protect uh, people who come to Vermont to access reproductive health care um, and also gender affirming care. Uh, in a nutshell, this is a bill that will protect people's health care information from other states that might have uh, uh, punitive legislation to to basically take away people's reproductive rights. Uh, and and it will also protect our health care providers here in the state from prosecution in other states. So those are some of the big things we've been taking on. You know, like I said, this last week was it was a bit of a roller coaster. We got a lot of really monumental work done. Um, this week, hopefully, it'll be a little bit more quiet. But whenever you say, whenever you anticipate something being quiet, it ends up being a bit more hectic. So we'll see. We'll see. You know about that. Well, cool. Nader, thank you for that. And. Um, as I said before, we've got some media here, and I'd like everyone, we've got a small enough group here, if we could just go around and uh, look at the screen. But Howard, uh, I'm going to ask you if you could uh, introduce yourself and and uh, your role with, with, with I, should, I was going to say VPR, but I'm trying to learn Vermont Public. <laughs> and then after you're done, tag somebody else. Yeah, I'm Howard Weiss Tisman. I'm with Vermont Public, formerly Vermont Public Radio. And I asked Mike if I could um, listen in, and I'm recording this as well. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to listen, I, I live in Southern Vermont. I live in Westminster. So I went through the, uh, the outage as you all did. Um, the Public Utility Commission is opening up an investigation kind of related to a 2022 storm uh, that hit Washington Electric Co-op pretty bad up in central Vermont. And the Public Utility Commission is just looking if there are um, ways that utilities can better um, respond to outages. There is a lot of interest um, with global climate change and storms are getting worse. Um, during the Washington Electric outage, they had a lot of problems with communication. They're a very small utility. They're a co-op. And they couldn't handle the calls. They were putting out inaccurate information. 
And so the Department of Public Service, uh, which is the state government kind of stepped in. That's the first time that that's happened. Um, it's my understanding to help them out. So, so I'm thinking of a story and I just wanted to hear um, some of the experiences of the folks in Southern Vermont. And that's it. Well, thank you. We, we've got some stories for sure. That's a, so Randy, you wanna go next? Yes, I'm Randy Holhut. I'm the news editor of the Commons, uh, Wyndham County's independent source for news and views, as everyone knows. And I'm here both as a reporter and as a constituent. I live on Spalding Hill Road in Dummerston, and we only lost power for three days, but it seemed hard to believe that some people in the center of Dummerston were out for five days. And uh, GMP usually prepares, in my experience, we've, this is was the longest power outage we've had here since uh, Joyce and I have moved here about 30 years ago. And um, this didn't seem out of the ordinary, but still was just kind of uh, unexpected. And so I'm here just to hear what other people around have, have uh, gone through with this storm. Yeah. Well, thank and yes, you. I'm recording and scribbling. <laughs> Suzanne, would you go next? Uh, sure. I'm Suzanne Weinberg, and I live in Dummerston on Camp Arden Road. Thank you. You're, we're just doing intros, right? Yeah. We are, but if you want to share your story a little bit, we can go back to it as well. But were you out for days? Uh, four, four days and three nights. Yeah. 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 And that's not the first time. We've had really long outages before, but it's the longest one in quite a while. Yeah. All right. Uh, Robert King. Yes. Yeah, I, I live up on Putney Mountain and I'm uh, interested in this meeting because of this, the questions of weather volatility. And we're just beginning to notice that in the uh, 23 years I've had a generator, I've only used it twice. And now we're uh, uh, approaching a time when we're going to use need to have these tools to use much more. And many people are buying expensive uh, propane powered uh, devices. Many people can't afford that. And so you're back to this very basic uh, lifestyle. Uh, mixed into that is the uh, influx of all the COVID refugees who are unencumbered with any knowledge of survival when the power goes off. <laughs> that, that concerns me deeply because as a community, we need to take care of everyone. And uh, so that, that I'm, that's why I'm interested in this meeting. Well, thank you. Those are certainly good points, Robert. Um, Sue and David. Hello, everyone. Sue Coakley and David Eggleton. Nice to see you all today. Thank you for holding this meeting today, Mike and Nader. And congratulations, Nader, on your first term as senator. Um, great thank to you. hear your report. Um, I'll just give my quick power outage story from this last storm. We were out for a little over four days. Uh, we live in um, up on Spring Hill Road in Putney, so it's very near the center. Um, we were part of a shorter power outage um, on Tuesday of the storm uh, that went from like 10 to around noon or 1230, and the lights came back on and we were grateful. And then around one o'clock, 1.30, we heard this boom and we know that was the transformer for the service uh, that comes to our house directly from Westminster Road. And I was pretty sure that was gonna be power outage for several days because I could tell how bad the power outage was everywhere and we were just one house. The rest of my neighbors had power uh, and that turned out to be the case. We were out of power for, till Saturday at noon. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were getting good information from Green Mountain Power about where they, what they were doing and where they were, and they did come and check in. And I felt like we, they did the, a good job of communicating. I, I, we understood. And, and the tools and apps they have to know where power is being restored was really helpful to us. Um, something that helped us, we, we heat primarily with a heat pump. Um, so we do have a backup, um, a wood furnace uh, that's quite old, but works. Uh, but we hardly needed the wood furnace because our house is energy efficient and we have passive solar. And so we only had to build a fire two or three times early in the morning just to take the chill off the house, which was very good. We were out of water, though, and we were out of cooking 
um, and our, our uh, electronics. And so neighbors helped us out with that uh, during that time. And it got us to thinking about what do we need? We're about to get a, um, an all electric car not to, on order since August, we hope to have it soon. Um, we began to think about how does our new electric car and a power pack, you know, provide potentially what we need uh, for these power outages. I agree they may be more frequent. Um, so we're really thinking about that. We do know that our heating load is very limited and that's a very, energy efficiency is actually a really important part of this whole response, I would say. Um, and the last thing I'll just say that, um, again, I think the power company did a good job. I'll talk to them about the transformer. That was the third time in, in nine months it went out. So there's some kind of problem. But <clears throat> I, I would just say that, uh, you know, Putney, I'm on the planning commission for Putney. We're writing the town plan for 20, 2023 town plan. It's an eight year town plan. And a very important part of that is climate resilience and um, also climate mitigation. Um, there's a draft goal to weatherize 90% of the homes in, in Putney over the next eight years. And I think that has to be part of the solution to the power outage because we won't need as much battery, for example, to recover. Um, it's more resilient. Um, and so I'm very interested um, in how Putney can accomplish that. But I'm going to also say, Mike, I appreciated, or maybe it was you, Nader, that talked about regional approaches. Uh, to dealing with things. And I think we're going to need a regional approach to be able to do this weatherization and resilience. And I'm interested in further exploring that. And um, I think, um, you know, for, uh, you know, the, the articles that are being written, uh, Randy, you know, in the Commons or, or um, for Vermont Radio, um, I think we need to talk about fundamentally energy efficiency as number one in our resilience strategy because then we don't need as much power and we have a lot more to do in that area and i think let's talk about that another time so you raise another point too that one of the things we're trying to make sure happens as we try and move to more electric is to harden the grid yeah and i think you, you could probably tell us more about that at another time but i just want to put that on the table and uh sarah Mike, sorry, can I just interject real quick, um, if, if that's all right? I, I did just want to, since we're talking about um, climate resiliency, I did want to note that um, Senator Harrison and I, uh, about a week or two ago, just literally in the middle of the storm, um, we submitted a new bill uh, to be drafted and introduced that will start the process of having Green Mountain Power and other utilities um, try to figure out where and how how much it will cost and whether it's feasible to bury uh, power lines that are considered at risk or um, vulnerable or critical to the energy infrastructure. I you know the the reasoning behind this is you know the the weather itself is changing and the snow is getting heavier and wetter um, as a result of this change which is causing a lot more of these trees to come down. And it's, you know, realistically, it's not going to change over the next couple of years. And so if we want to reduce the costs when it comes to repairing and reduce the, the human cost when it comes to people who have to be without power for several days, uh, you know, it's, we, we think it's important to make sure landlines are, or um, power lines are getting buried and, um, to protect them from the elements. I, I think that's an important part of climate resiliency. So just wanted to put that in there. You know, um, Nader, if I could just say something uh, briefly on that. Um, when so you look at that, we, please, oh, hold on. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to derail things. I did just want to okay. add that we'll and then we can- Keep going keep around going the, and let okay. people introduce themselves before we go around again, okay? Sorry about that. Sarah? Hi. I'm Sarah Betacek, and my husband and I live in Dummerston on Middle Road, and uh, we lost power for four days. Uh, we did fine. Um, we don't have a generator, uh, so uh, we lost furnace, water pump, uh, voice over internet phone, um, and we only have a weak cell signal. Um, as I said, we, you know, we were prepared. We have a backup. Uh, heat source of a propane fireplace insert and we always keep supply of water but um i was i'm very aware of a lack of communication 
uh, during a storm. Um, and since we only have a weak cell signal, I consider myself lucky if I can text the single word outage to GMP and have it delivered safely. Um, and that means that getting updates about where things stand, especially for a long-term outage, um, was, was sort of impossible. Like GMP didn't know what to expect. And, and normally, I think GMP uh, does excellent job in communicating what, when you have access to the web. Their outage maps um, are full of information, which really helps put any outage in context. And uh, it, it could be that I'm uh, spoiled by having access to the internet most of the time. I'm used to getting a lot of information from Vermont Public and the Commons and, and uh, BCTV, Vermont Digger. But when the power is down and there's very little cell signal and your cell battery uh, is depleted rapidly searching for a signal, you can't really look anywhere online. And I, every time I would turn my cell phone on to see if there was an update, it would lose battery and there wouldn't be any update available yet. And I would get a, an alert from VT Alert that there was something going on that I should know about and go to a website. Well, I can't get to a website, which just raises questions. I found that the only real information would have been available by radio, but the radio, local radio stations really had very limited information. Even Vermont Public, um, when they covered the storm, they mentioned massive outages, but it didn't give me any sense of where the outages were, how many incidents. And it was only after a couple of days when my daughter came by to do a wellness check and showed me the outage map that I could see, ah, oh, 81% of Dummerston is out, ah, oh, the 23 incidents. And it gave me a much better sense of what was happening and why we weren't getting an update about an expected restoration. Um, I, know that, I know that a lot of people must have limited cell service. And so I really wonder why we have gotten away from having a radio broadcast that can be accessed by almost any household by transistor radio, which really gives context. Um, when Irene went through, my husband and I didn't live in Vermont. We lived down in Connecticut. And at that time, we lost power for five days. Um, it was an age when we also had a landline. And there was an emergency service in our town, which gave an update every day by phone. You'd get a call. Um, you know, and it would say, you know, there are warming sessions here. You, this is how many people are coming in. This is what's expected. This is what's happening in the next town over. And it was a wonderful um, sense of what your resources were, whether or not you should really drive down the road or not. Um, and I know that they're not landlines anymore um, for the most part, but the ability to receive a broadcast is still there. And it would seem to me, even if it's not broadcast um, with the news on the hour, which seemed to be a very short um, overview, and it was helpful, but it, it wasn't as comprehensive as I thought perhaps was warranted when I actually saw the extent of the map of how many individual outages there were. It was, it was eye-opening. And it, unless my daughter had come by and brought her phone with a screenshot of that, I would never have had that sense. So I'm interested in seeing expanded communication, maybe by radio, um, something that gives context. I think GMP de you know, basically does a very good job in communicating if you have internet. At, um, and uh, so that's my story. Sarah, that's a great point. And what road do you live on again? I'm on Middle Road. Oh, right by Kipling. Yeah. It's amazing how how many outages were on Middle Road. <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> so Lynn, you can tell us about it. Uh, should I go next? Okay. Um, yeah, I was out for five days. Um, I do not have uh, additional heat sources. Um, and of course, same thing with, you know, no internet, no phone. Uh, cell service, etc. Um, and 
the one good thing though is my plow guy came <laughs> early in the morning came back actually several times but so i was able uh you know to get out um of course going down middle road uh i did not do that but my son my son did and of course that was a disaster um so i think and and actually the two two houses down i ran into him yesterday they were out for 12 hours. And here we were, David and I, who live next to each other, we're out for five days. Now that's, you know, I'm sure there's a good reason for that, but maybe there would be a way to, you know, get us all together somehow so that when one house is up, you know, we're all up because that's kind of depressing. Um, and I thank you, Mike, for your, your help. Uh, you know, with alerting people. The other thing is speaking about, um, oh yeah, you know, just go to our website, Xfinity, at the very beginning, you know, say, oh, you know, there are going to be some issues, blah, 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 we're doing our work, et cetera, to make sure everything goes well. Here's our website. Well, hello, we can't reach the website. Um, and anyway, so it was, um, we, I will say we ate a lot of McDonald's. <laughs> so um, thanks for sharing that, Lynn. And it reminds me, there were a lot of people in a lot of situations where they couldn't get out because there were trees down on lines and right. the lines were there and nobody could move it until Green Mountain came. And we even had one person who texted me in Dummerston, said, I'm a young mom, I've got a 13 month old and we're running out of milk here. So Nader happened to be home that day and he he ran some milk out. I forget. She was over by the river, wasn't she, Nader? It was. It was actually right off of uh, Camp Arden Road. And um, that yeah, was uh, it wasn't that was an interesting day. I, I, I was home that day and my neighbor and I, um, you know, he's got he got a tractor and we both have chainsaws. So we actually spent a fair amount of time removing the trees from our road and and delivering milk um and i was like hey you know this is this is part of the service here um and you know i i did, did just want to share my my quick story about uh about the storm um you know we were one of the fortunate ones our power was only out for one day and which i found interesting because i live at the end of a very rural road um you know in one direction it starts going towards town and the other direction, it just turns into a class four road. Um, what I found out though, towards the end of the storm, there, there were suddenly two GMP trucks in our driveway. And I, I went out just to go see what was going on. And I talked to one of the workers and they said, you're still getting power, but the top of the pole actually caught on fire. So we're replacing that part, uh, but everything else is fine. And I was like, wow, all right. I don't, I didn't, yeah, so it was that was stressful, but yeah, I, I mean, it's I'm glad that the fire didn't really um, spread or anything like that. I didn't even know what had happened until the GMP workers told me. Um, yeah, so that's that's my story. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nader. It's it certainly hit Dummerston Putney this area as hard as anything. So. So Sue, I wanted to backtrack to you because you had something you wanted to add to this mix. Sure, um, I just wanted to say to Nutter, um, you know, the bill you're working on to bring you electric utility service underground, at least in some areas. Uh, other states who are doing that are looking at putting combined utilities, so communication and electric, all underground because they're all at risk. So mm -hmm. if wires are going underground and a conduit is being conduits are being done, you can do multiple services at that point. So I encourage yeah. you to think in that integrated way. It also makes it more cost effective because you're sharing it across a couple of services, not just yeah. a lot. I mean, I agree that that would make sense. I mean, that's part of the project um, is to mm -hmm. figure out how we can put it all underground, really, because I mean they all travel on the same poles and the same wires. So you know, it wouldn't quite make sense to have, you know, just one telephone pole with just, you know, a fiber optic cable and then all the other wires underground. So, yes, I, I agree with you. Yeah. I would just like to add that our second outage, the longer one, 
that Sue mentioned affected only us is because of the development pattern just here where several properties were developed roughly around the same time and a line was run for them. And this house had been previously done as a, in a subdivision of a property and is a lone house on a spur off of the line that goes along Westminster Road. So when power was first restored for the area, we benefited from that and had power for that hour and a half or whatever that Sue mentioned. But when the transformer blew, we were the only affected customer by that. It took them 10 minutes from arrival to departure to repair our problem. But because we were one house, we think we were a very low priority because other things were six houses, 12 houses, 18 houses. So okay. I'm trying to answer Lynn a little bit in that the order in which houses have been built on properties that are fairly close to each other can affect who's alone and who's with others uh, in the boat, so to speak. Yeah, that's sort of what I figure. Um, but it would be interesting if somehow they could update that in some way. And also it would save them a lot of time and effort. If everything was on one line or, you know, it would be instead of individual uh, houses. Also, I didn't say I'm Lynn Barrett and I'm also president of the board of the Commons newspaper. And hello, Randy. <laughs> but I'm here today for myself. <laughs> and, and Howard, I hope you heard Sarah's piece about maybe some more detailed coverage. Um, and I know the interesting thing about this storm is uh, it was much worse in Southern Vermont. Now, when I went up to Montpelier uh, that Tuesday, uh, pretty much as soon as I got past Springfield, Vermont, there was hardly anything there. And, and here we were snowed in, blocked in and not far away, there wasn't much. So maybe that was a piece of why um, there wasn't that much coverage, but I know during the aftermath of Irene, DPR at the time did an amazing job of regular broadcasts, and they were pretty much it. So a lot of us depended on that. So, um, Howard, if you could give a word that it, that kind of a in an emergency, that kind of coverage is is really helpful. Yeah. It's really interesting, and I don't want to divert um, too much from this conversation, but the future of radio and broadcast is very much a conversation that's happening. Um, you know, for very, you know, people are moving more and more to the internet. Um, people are accessing us more and more through their apps, through their smartphones, um, streaming. And, you know, the future, and it might be 10 or 20 or 40 years in the, um, in the future, is moving away from towers on mountains, which are very expensive and are not even 100% reliable. Um, so it's a really, it's a fascinating conversation going on because we are also, and what some of the utilities will tell us, we all are so much more reliant now on electricity than we were even during Irene, and certainly we were 40 years ago. Um, with everything we have in our house, if you lost power 40 years ago, you'd lose your, you know, refrigerator and your television, you know, and your lights maybe. Um, but now we have so much attached to the grid um, at the same time that climate change is happening. So again, it, it's a fascinating conversation about broadcast and electricity and um, how the whole system works. Um, but 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 that being said, you know, it's interesting, the information we put out, um, if the outages that happened a few weeks ago had happened in Chittenden County, might there have been more coverage? Maybe. Um, can we do a better job covering Southern Vermont? Um, yeah, it's uh, so, you know, a lot to be said and no easy answers, I don't think, for any of it. Suzanne. Yeah, I just want to loop back to something Sarah was saying about the communication. And, you know, it is really maddening when everybody says, go to our website, go to our app and all of that. And 
we have no cell phone coverage on our road. And so we still do have a landline and I have an old princess phone that I, that I plug in. So if the electricity goes off, I can uh, reach Green Mountain Power. And the strange thing about this storm was that um, for the entire four days, the recording said, we're aware of the outage in your area, but we don't have any estimated time about when it's gonna be restored. And I think all, most of us, if we do have some kind of concept about how long it's gonna be and how, how to, that helps with knowing how to cope. And I think this was an unusual situation where there weren't any updates. A lot of times we have tons of power outages on the street and a lot of times there is recorded information so you can just call for, for an update. And I don't know why that was the case. Maybe they were just so overwhelmed, um, but, but that made it worse, just not knowing you know, what we should do with the food in the freezer and you know, how long it was gonna be. So that's, that's my comment on the communication. Yeah, I, I experienced the same thing. Um, and the other frustrating thing was I would look out my window and there go like 12 or 20 trucks all going just past, you know, past the house down the road. Or I, or I, you know, once I was able to get out, I'd go down, um, down to McDonald's and on the way, there are about, you know, almost 25 trucks heading to New Hampshire, which is, that's fine. But you're like, and I actually, a couple of times I saw the Xfinity truck across the street and I, of course, ran out and, you know, talked to them. Oh, yes, you know, we're trying to help, blah, blah, blah. And then I saw the, the Green Mountain Power guys, you know, up the road a little bit and I went and talked to them. Um, but, you know, it, it, they have, they have a system and, um, but it was kind of, it was like, ah, uh, there are just two of us here left. Can you please help us? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But it's always like that. If it's an outage right at your house, it's your yeah. last in line. Um, exactly. the, the other thing was they really, they did bring in crews from all over the country because it was eventually a crew from Tulsa, Oklahoma who appeared on our road. Yeah. So that was, that was really strange. You know, the sun was out and they were all standing in their shirt sleeves, basking in the sun, waiting for their next orders. Yeah. And, um, you know, they weren't even local people, so. Well, they had people from Kentucky as well. They had people from up north. The guys from up north actually were on our street um, and helped. So that was good. At, at this time, I think I want to shout, give a shout out to Candace Morgan at Green Mountain Power. Yeah, she was um, She was, uh, doing a lot of work over that whole storm as the communication spokesperson uh, to legislators and other media. And she was accessible and really helped relay information from, from a lot of us. Um, that being said, um, it's a challenge when we have this kind of storm. And one of the things she shared is the first thing they had to do before they could fix any home hookups was they had to clear power lines from roads. And a lot of roads couldn't get plowed because they had hot wires on them. So that was the the difference between this storm, I think, and others is that it took so many power lines down across roads. Um, I think one of the things to note also is though, this storm was no surprise. Uh, it was predicted and it, we may have to look at whether they just need more capacity instead of having to rely on crews from Kentucky and Oklahoma. Um, and Suzanne, the piece about cell coverage is, um, we keep working to expand that, but I have to say the quickest way for a, a utility or a legislator to get swamped with complaints is to suggest putting up a cell tower somewhere. <laughs> Most of us want cell towers, we sell phones, but we don't want cell towers. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, Mike, just to be clear, I'm actually happy to not have cell coverage at my house. I am i don't want to be glued to my little computer in my pocket. So, um, but I was just wanting to stress the isolation um, because in a situation like that, you do need something. So, yeah. Mike, I'll just add um, to this issue of cell service and how that can be extended. Um, there are companies now 
that are providing what you would call emergency cell service, um, places where there's large outages, like in Puerto Rico when they had a hurricane, but they can actually provide cell service for multiple carriers and drop it in fairly quickly. Um, and I think that needs to be looked at as well. It can either be a way to improve service all the time uh, for people like Sarah, um, but also uh, provide an emergency response. Um, uh, and, and the other thing I'll just mention that hasn't been brought up here that I would hope that media would cover is the continuous importance of Vermonters taking care of Vermonters. In our neighborhood, people looked out for each other. They helped each other out. We actually had fun together. We had meals together um, when we didn't have service at our house. And we've done the same. And I think it's just part of the culture. We'll always continue to need, need to do that in addition to having the services in place to restore service. That's a great point. And and we have AT&T has put a temporary tower up in Putney at one time, um, but they took it down once something else because there was a lot of pushback as to having it here at all. Um, Robert, up on Putney Mountain, how much snow did you get? Uh, 31 inches. 31. Oh, and further up the road, uh, it, it was over four feet. So, okay. So are you past Leon Wood Road? Uh, my power line comes through the Leon Wood Road. Okay. It crosses yeah. over Putney Mountain, and, and then it's a class four non-maintained road. When the farm was operating, we kept the, the, the road free of trees because we sugared on a, a, a lot out that way. Mm -hmm. But since the farm is closed, that's all grown over, and that's, that's where the breaks happen. Yeah. It's one of the things that I've been hearing from people is a sense that they have not been keeping up with clearing lines. And I don't know if other people have experience with that. There's still a line um, on my road that has a tree precariously resting on it. Um, it's, it's been there for a while actually, so. <laughs> I see that on middle road as well. They, they're, you know, there could be a lot more work on the trees. I mean, it's sort of obvious when the trees are hanging over the wire that something could happen. I'm just checking in like to see if we're gonna um, veer into some other topics in the remainder of the hour, or are we gonna stay on this um, topic? Well, we can take up anything you, you'd like. Okay, well, I don't wanna derail anything, but the, I, I wasn't gonna stay if we were gonna keep debriefing the storm, so just checking in do people have other things to say about the storm and the grid and i'm happy to move on to no. something different as well okay yeah and i'll just say one more thing about that is that i've talked with electric companies about burying wires and it's just so expensive and so every expansion has to do with permission of the landowners too so at every level i've talked with people about the practicality of like having a wire across the river or something, they just always say too expensive and too difficult getting permission, but you know, go for it. I did have a question for you and, and Nader, is your name pronounced Nader? Is that, is that correct? Yep, Nader, and, like water with an N at the beginning. Cause I've heard um, it pronounced so many different ways. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I have um, sent in an email to my town clerk, but I'm interested in what the discussion was like about ranked choice voting for the presidential primary for 2024. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me just as a pretty practical person that a year would be enough to get things in place to try that out. And I'm wondering just a, a few little points that you might say about yeah. why that didn't go through uh, for this, the you know immediate pres presidential election. Sure. Well, interestingly enough, we just took some testimony in House Government Operations about that, and we especially heard from town clerks. Um, right. But I but I thought yeah. it, it's something that's already been passed in the Senate. If I'm right, Is yeah, that it, it has been passed yeah. in the Senate. The you know the the main opposition to it. Um, it was pretty light. I think there were six or maybe seven no votes. I can't remember off the top of my head, but the main opposition was that we don't understand it, so we're going to vote no. Um, I, I did vote yes. It it did take me a while to understand why ranked choice voting is um, 
is practical and beneficial. And, you know, I think that, you know, th there is the um, opt-in method or um, the opt-in option for it. So towns aren't going to be compelled to do ranked choice voting. Uh, you know, we did, I, I did hear from some town clerks in Wyndham County that, you know, they have concerns about it being required because, you know, even though they understand it and it makes sense, there's, they, these town clerks are getting a lot of, a, a lot of messages from folks who are frankly just pushing conspiracy theories and sowing distrust in the electoral process. And so town clerks were getting a little hesitant about changing the process uh, for fear of more backlash about conspiracy theories when it comes to voting. Uh, but, but that's- That's very chilling to hear that that's the kind of pressure that they're, you know, these educated people who are doing an important job, that they're bowing to that scares me. Yeah. I, in their defense, I wouldn't say they're bowing to it necessarily, but, you know, they were voicing it as a concern. And, you know, it, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated topic when you're in that position as, as the town clerk and, you know, you, you recognize the utility of something, but then you also have opposition coming at, you know, different angles. So I, I, I think they, they walk a pretty fine line with that, but yeah. One of the things we heard. But you're saying, oh, sorry, Mike. I was just going to ask you, but you only had five or six people. Are you saying in the Senate who voted in against the Senate? It or yes, there, there were. I, I think it was six or seven. I, um, I I could pull that up and get it for you, but it was around six or seven. Um, and it was mainly, you know, when they spoke on the Senate floor, their main reasoning was, we don't understand how this works. Even though I felt that the reporter of the bill did an excellent job of explaining how it works. Um, but yeah, okay, that, that was I'm not, not going to hold my breath. I won't hold my breath then. Yeah. So just to follow up on a piece Nader shared, we heard testimony that all across the country, town clerks and election officials are retiring or resigning because of the pressures and the harassment they're feeling. And uh, even in Vermont, uh, they've they've had some of that. One of the biggest obstacles and why it needs time, uh, we, we heard, is there's the education piece on educating the public, but also we still have 100 towns in Vermont that do not use machine counting and to do instant runoff. And that's probably, there's there's two forms of, of ranked choice voting. And what we're probably looking at, looking at is um, IRV, instant runoff voting. Um, to do that manually is going to take days and to set up systems for that is going to take a while. So that's one of the biggest pieces of why the, the town clerks don't feel that Vermont is going to be, could be ready for this, for the primary. I think there's a sentiment to move in that direction, but that the logistics are going to take longer than, than we might think or want. And, and we can't force towns to start using machines. Uh, but I would, I would also, I would check in with Lori at Emerson Town Hall and see how she feels about this. And um, I know over in um, Brattleboro, the town clerk is uh, very enthusiastic about that, of, of ranked choice voting, but she also feels uh, it's not the timeline to go for the 24 primaries uh, is too soon. The logistics of it are just uh, beyond what they think they can take on on top of everything else they do. Anybody else have concerns that they think we should be looking at that we're not? Uh, what about this new heat bill? Seems to be the pretty, it seems to be very controversial. Um, and maybe you can explain it a little bit if people are interested. Sure. Uh, so we passed that out of the Senate um, recently. It was primarily worked on in Senate Natural Resources. And right now, the, the Affordable Heat Act is 
primarily consisting of five different studies and also the creation of the infrastructure for the uh, the clean heat credits that fossil fuel companies and transporters who come into the state with fossil fuels uh, would have to purchase. The there there is a lot of incorrect information that is getting spread around, which is uh, which states that everybody's heating costs are going to rise. Um, this bill does not take effect until 2025, and the legislature, at least in the current form of the bill, the legislature will have to vote on it a second time after having received all the studies back regarding um, the cost for Vermonters, uh, the feasibility, and whether or not the cost benefit uh, makes sense, because it is possible that it could raise costs for Vermonters. It's also possible that it could reduce costs. But we won't know until we really study how it will work. Um, you know, this this was one of the steps that we took when it comes to addressing climate change. Um, you know, I, I've spoken with some farmers in Wyndham County and you know, some of their concerns, and actually one of these farmers sits on the Climate Council. Uh, one of their concerns is that really some of some of our some of the ways that we can actually really reduce carbon emissions comes from our food systems, you know, we do import a lot of food and going to a system that focuses more so on local and sustainable food systems will actually reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, and, and yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. Cool. For now. Um, Nader, I just wanted to follow up on that to, to share. There's a lot of misinformation about whether people can save money on this. And I'm going to share my story quickly. Uh, for 30 years, I burned five cords of wood a year. At today's prices of $300 a cord or more, that's about $1,500 for a heating season. Um, put in a heat pump, heating costs for the season now are about $1,000. So that's clean heat. That's a lot cheaper. And that's a situation that we can replicate across Vermont. So when the, the oil companies, of course, they don't want you to start thinking about that, but they're not doing anybody any favors when they raise when they raise their prices. And I know that they're tied to markets, but those markets are going to stay volatile and electric costs are something we can we can have some control over. And Sue Coakley, I see you ready to jump in on this. Yeah. Well I, I was I'm going to add my very quick story also is that we heat with a heat pump, as I mentioned earlier, and our biggest heat bill, our biggest electric bill this year was $200 for the month. Um, our last month was $150. So that's way cheaper than burning wood uh, and it's emission free because most of our electricity is emission free. It's mostly renewable energy. Um, and so people need to understand that. But I'm going to come back to clean heat will be affordable. Uh, and any heat will be more affordable if our homes are energy efficient. I'm a broken record about this, but we waste a lot of money and um, fuel, whether it's electricity or propane or uh, oil, yeah. when we're not we're, when we're losing that heat out of our houses. And they're not as our houses are not as climate resilient and not as healthy and safe when they're leaking heat um, that way. So I think the clean heat bill will be affordable. It will be more affordable. Mm -hmm when we help make houses more efficient um, and that also makes them more resilient, healthy and safe for everybody. Uh, and yes. that has to be a top priority. I, I, I agree, Sue. There's, there was actually, um, you bring up a point that reminds me of something else, which is also that the Affordable Heat Act, um, it also includes a good, a health, a, a large lump sum investment for uh, weatherization training. Um, you know, what, what we need to make sure we have is a workforce that knows how to do weatherization. Um, you know, it's it's a well-paying job, and you know, we, we were trying to connect the two because you know we do have a lot of old housing stock in Vermont, and you know, it doesn't quite make sense. You know, if you have a two hundred year old house to basically you know heat the outdoors if your house is so drafty. Yeah. So, you know, they they do go hand in hand. Uh, you know, weatherization and uh, clean energy like that comes from heat pumps. Um, and one more point, there, there is another piece of uh, misinformation that gets put out there is that 
folks are all going to have to switch to just heat pumps. That's not true. It's it's inaccurate. Uh, there's nothing in the bill that does that. It really just creates more incentives. Um, if it gets implemented, it creates more incentives and makes heat pumps a lot more affordable. You know, yeah, that was my next that was my next question because I've heard both sides of that story. You're, everyone's going to have to get on a, onto a heat pump pump or just it's basically encouraging and making weatherization more possible for folks. Um, so that's of interest. But the grid, I mean, it, let's say everybody does go on heat pumps. Our, I don't think our grid is ready for that. Well, well I think we, we are at this point. Uh, hardening the grid is something we need to look at. And I think Sue can add to that too, the ISO uh, situation. That's right. Um, it, it's the ISO, so there's the overall grid supply of electricity, and then there's also the ability of the grid, the distribution and transmission, to be able to handle not only increased demand at a winter peak, um, but also it's two-way flows of power. When the grid was first set up, it was, it was designed to deliver power to homes, not necessarily to receive power from homes. But today, we're prosumers. We're also generating electricity. So we're developing, and Green Mountain Power is actually ahead of the curve in, from many electricity, and many utilities. We're developing a smart grid. A smart grid can receive and um, provide power, two-way flows of power supported by two-way communication and maintain power quality through all of it. And that very same smart grid that can read what the power quality is and correct it and deal with two-way flows of power also tells you where outages are and, and what is needed to repair them. So the smart grid to support two-way flows of power, those renewables, self-generation also helps us in, in, in recovery. So that, that is coming. And again, I think Vermont is really, a, I, I've, I've worked on this nationally and Vermont is a little bit ahead of the curve on that. There's still more investment to be made. Putney last summer had a replacement of transformers town-wide that um, was meant to support that as well as to reduce the time needed for recovery. So there's, there's that side of it. Um, just another thing on clean heat and Nader, thank you for bringing up the workforce issue. There's having enough people who can who are trained to install the weatherization and, and heat pumps. But there's also, and I think this goes back to the fossil fuel dealers and an important conversation to have with them, is there's people who've made their living installing, you know, propane and oil boilers and furnaces and and, and, and that's what they know in service. Uh, we don't have enough people to do the heat pump. So we need a workforce transition um, and support for business models. And that will also be for electrification of transportation too. How do we take all the gas stations and fuel oil dealers and give them a new way forward in our clean energy economy? And uh, if we can focus the conversation there, I think some of the resistance goes away because people are looking for jobs that right. and and continue to serve their customers. So there that's, is, uh, I would add that in. There is huge economic opportunity here. So uh, before we go, we're about out of time. I just wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to, to share anything about the storm or anything else that's kind of burning a hole and you just have to share it. Well, I want, I want to thank everyone. I uh, also want to remind people that we do this regularly. Nader and Senator Harrison also host regular events and show up at other events. So, um, we're we're around uh please feel free to be in touch with us if you have a question uh whether it's you need milk in a snowstorm <laughs> or you're trying to get through to, to something else we we do try and be accessible to everybody and uh nader um i'll give you the last word here oh, thank you mike and uh thank you everybody for coming to this meeting and um you know it reminds me of a couple of years back when we served together, Mike, and we, we did similar meetings. So it's nice to be uh, back in the same Zoom room with you. Uh, you know, Senator Harrison and I are continuing this conversation regarding the storm. We're actually going to Wardsboro on Monday uh, with Representative Sibilia to meet with folks up there. Um, you know, as was mentioned earlier, I can't remember who brought it up, but there, there was conversation of a regional approach regarding um, climate resiliency. And, you know, we're... Uh, I think the delegation at large is really on the same page when it comes to that. 
Um, I did put my email in the chat. I, I do send out a newsletter probably once a month. You know, it, it generally just contains summaries of the bills that we've been working on in the Senate. And, uh, you know, it's just about once a month, nothing. I'm not gonna, I don't send out emails every single day. So no worries there. If you'd like to be on that email list, please feel free to drop me an email. Or if you have any questions or concerns about any other issues, you know, you can always reach out. Um, and can thanks you tell again. Me a, can you tell me a little more about that meeting Monday, Nader? Meeting Monday is at, let me just pull it up so I can give you the right time. I believe it's four o'clock. Yep, four o'clock, Wardsboro at the town hall. Pretty sure it's the town hall. I'm gonna double check that, but it, yes, it'll be in Wardsboro. Quite certain it's at the town hall. Cool, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you everybody and have a good day. Yeah.